my bedroom so like on Gmail. Yeah. <laughs> um by like asking a few questions about us and our stance on like anything, science fiction and its relation to our lives. So this time around in this scene we talked about science fiction and political and metro player and its intentions. Um so what was interesting when we brought this up amongst us, we amongst ourselves, we all had a different opinions about what how we felt about the issue. So this is my response. And it's very internet loving, so <laughs> this is my response. Trigger warning. Trigger warning. <laughs> For me, Metro Polarity is an expressly political endeavor. No, I'm not concerned with politics, with rubbing elbows with old white men or lobbying for marginal legal successes. Fuck all that noise. Marginalized populations are politicized not because we want to be, but because it's a political act to express the uneven distribution of power in our country. As blacks and queers and women and working poor, we carry generations and generations of fragmented stories, ones created out of anger, fear, disconnection, and isolation. But now we live in a newborn world of information, increasingly codependent with that resilient, inclusive, mostly free, anarchic machine, the internet. And culture and change can be generated by the internet. Voices that are commonly disenfranchised can build their own spaces on the internet. My own identity has been formed in large part by the internet. By the internet. Memories, stories, and identities have, have been created in interacting with others through AOL chat, multi-user dungeons, forums, and personal web pages. Queer kids coming up now are experimenting with identities in places where they are protected from our country's religions and popular kids. I truly believe that we are living in a science fiction reality, and if science fiction has taught us anything, it's that a mastery of technology is integral to survival in a plugged-in world. Today, the digital divide is real and tangible, and our identities hinge on our ability to create and manipulate data in the cybersphere to affect change in real life. The free-for-all who can access it, open-source information-sharing nature of the Internet is a model for our real life. Cities like Philadelphia are hurting for a space to discuss the future of our communities. Fragmented communities have exhausted their reactionary, grieving, angry stories. The advent of the information age can also mean the beginning of new stories for us freaks and outcasts, whose existences are politicized by overpowering mainstream media, that tries its best to distract the masses with golems like Jennifer Aniston and Google images of Kim Kardashian's vampire face bath. <laughs> Metro clarity is a real-life answer to this void of critical, future-oriented stories for the urban have-nots. I intend that we become a space where we can examine our world speculati speculatively while sharing skills to control the media and the cybersphere, where ideas, solutions, and hope can spread like a virus globally. When we began forming and developing Metro Polarity, I had in my head science and orb consciousness raising. I was thinking about the democratic power of the internet, of perfecting the art of coercion by digital means in the name of justice and education, art and expression. I was praying desperately for a space as populations with difficult and fragmented intergenerational stories to tell, to explore and critique our increasingly globalized and complex world, alerting the master of the technologies that we have been blessed with in our science fiction age. Let's create memes with more substance than feisty kitty cats and babies eating lemons. Let's take hold of our representations and warm our way into the mainstream. Meme be a meme. Nice. Yeah. yeah. Um, and to prove how integrated I am with the internet and what a long <laughs> history I have with it, I have um, this thing called Web 1.0 Erases a Woman. And it's just kind of a little bit of a chronology of my relationship with the internet. Um, and also like a testament that not just like white males are on the internet or create or produce internet fiction. Hell yeah. Um, Web 1.0 raises a woman. 10. Yellow man running who teaches her that grown men like it when you're 10 online and akimbo. Screech to let her play AOL trivia with a librarian and PA, spy the RM. She wants, to, she wants to show him how she masturbates. On his AOL hometown page, she looks like a caveman. On her birthday, he has a nervous breakdown. I'm so sorry and I'm ashamed of my behavior. 11. Her dad is too old for parental controls, and she and her friends score modeling databases for believable girls to be. They get to know the white boys in the front room, make them fall in love while they laugh and sing all the lyrics to that Aaliyah album. She and Vicky type in taboo erotic stories. They're all full of age play and incest. Weird, they say, and stick batteries inside their vaginas. Make pancakes and fuck around on Top City. 12. Jay sends a locket in the mail from Texas. He shaves his head for her because she told him she has a thing for Drew Carey, which isn't true, but he's very sweet, and her house is so quiet since her dad got sick. They sing Tenacious D on the phone while she says she is 17 in the middle of the night. Picture is some Mexican girl with green eyes, and he really loves her. When you're 18 and I'm 26, it won't seem too weird. We can share my studio, and you can work at the Radio Shack, too. 
On Christmas, he finds out, and on the phone in Newark, New Jersey, she stifles a smile that is reserved for when she gets into inescapable trouble at school or home, like when a teacher yells, yell, when a teacher tells you how lazy or hateful you are in front of 20 other kids and it hurts. He cries, and she does not tell him she's 12. She tells him that her uncle raped her, and now she doesn't trust men enough to tell the truth. For three years, she watches him miss her on his life journal. For 10 years, his fat letters tucked away in elusive Frank Trapper Keeper. 13. Discover siblings' kitty porn in a folder labeled work shit. 10 year old, 11 year old, 12 year old, 13 year old in a search box on Napster. On Napster. I knew what she said. 15. He thinks she's a scarred young playwright at NYU. He thinks she's this former child prostitute with blonde hair and pointy nipples who drag races when she feels suicidal. He thinks she has a bulldog and lives in someone's basement. Every night for two years, they call each other and touch themselves to his own whispered violence. He wants her to play house with him and wants to tie her up. She sends him links to cool clothes and finds him dates on nerve. She takes his phone calls in the bathroom at the mall while her boyfriend steals Timberlands at Burlington Coat Factory. Sometimes she can't take the apartment's mental illness, and he listens to her break snow globes and whimper. He insists they play house that he would rock her to sleep. Once her family drives through Annapolis to drop off her aunt, he tells her to meet him at the rest stop. But she's a Somalian-looking high schooler, so that wouldn't work out. Lying makes love such a kidney stone. Painful, passable. She spends a lot of time on her Yahoo avatar. Yeah. Yeah. Holler at us on the internet. Yeah. Metropolarity.net.tumblr.com. Yeah. Follow us on Tumblr. <laughs>